have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to Amos chapter 5, starting in verse number 16. We will read uh, to the end of the chapter this week, all the way down through verse number 27. Amos 5, starting in verse 16. This is the Word of God. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, and in all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation. And in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sikuth, your king, and Kayun, your star god, your images that you have made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Let me pray for us and ask for wisdom before we go any further studying this word this morning. Father, we thank you for your word, that it is true and that we can trust it. Lord, we know every word of scripture is inspired and is meaningful to us today. That's certainly true of this passage this morning. So Lord, give us your wisdom by your spirit. Move in our hearts. Cause us to obey you, to understand you. And Lord, I pray that you would just work your will in our lives. Uh, bless the preaching of your word today. And may your word be heard and not my own, that you receive all the glory. And it's in the name of Christ I pray these things. Amen. This past year, I've heard a phrase used a lot. I've heard people say, I can't wait for that day. Or I can't wait for the day. We all have that day in our minds. There's a day that's coming where life will be like a pie in the sky, right? All of our problems will go away. Maybe it's that day when the trial you're dealing with goes away. Maybe it's that day when you retire from your job you've worked at for a long time and you get to enjoy the amenities of your life. Maybe it's that day when you get a break from work to go on a vacation that day when you graduate from school and get to embark on a new journey in life. That day when you get married and your life changes forever. I don't know why that was funny. It does change your life forever. That wasn't even an intended joke, so save that laughter for later. I, I know this in this past year, I've longed for that day when the COVID stuff goes away and everything goes back to normal, right? We long for that day. And I don't know if that day will ever actually come true. But all of us long for that last day, that day where the Lord Jesus will return, will descend from heaven. He will right every wrong. We all long for that day because we understand what that day entails. Well, you see in our text, Israel is longing for that day. They're longing for the day of the Lord. But what Israel expects to find on that day 
and what they will actually experience are two totally different things. We see from this text that God's covenant blessing will not be extended to those who neglect his covenant. That's the main idea of our text this morning. So Israel's longing for that day, but that day does not hold what they think that it does. We'll see why in our text today. Upon coming to a text like this, it's important that we remember that our God is a covenant God. He is a God of promise. He keeps his promises to his people. He relates to his people on the, gra- on the basis of a gracious covenant. That's true in the Old Testament. That's true with us today. And particularly in the Old Testament, God invites Israel into covenant with him at Mount Sinai. And when he invites them into covenant with him, he gives them his law. He gives his people his rules. And he tells the people, if you do this, you will be blessed. But if you do not, you will be cursed. And if you read through Exodus and read through Deuteronomy, you see the people of Israel say, we will do it. We will do all that the Lord has commanded. We're seeing today in our text, that God keeps his word. Great is thy faithfulness. There is no shadow of turning with thee. God does not change. But his people, his people have walked away from the covenant. First thing we see in our text is that the day of the Lord will be a day of salvation and judgment. It is both. It is not one or the other, the day of the Lord is a day of salvation and judgment. The first thing we need to tackle in this text is the phrase, the day of the Lord. When Amos said the day of the Lord, his audience knew exactly what he meant. Just like if I said to you, do you want to come over to my house and celebrate the 4th of July with me? You would know that what I meant was not you would come over and we'd look at the calendar and say, aha, it's the 4th of July, all right, and go on. No, that means you'll come over, we'll barbecue, we'll light fireworks, we'll sing the Star Spangled Banner, we'll wear red, white, and blue, all that kind of stuff. There's a cultural connotation with that. Well, so it is with the phrase, the day of the Lord. It was a common cultural idea for Amos's audience, but it needs explanation for us. So the day of the Lord was this day where God would appear and God would appear to strike down all of his enemies. He would wipe the floor with those people who opposed him and then he would establish his kingdom, which has no end. The day of the Lord was a day of freedom, For the people of Israel. That's what they were expecting on that day. That the Lord would come and right all of the wrongs. It was an eschatological event, if you want a theological term. It was an end of time kind of event. God would right all wrongs. It would be a good day for the people of God. There was a common idea in Amos' day that any king who was truly powerful could win a war in as little as just one day. If a king really wanted to flex his muscles and show that he was really someone to take notice of, he just wiped the floor with that army in just one day, win a war in one day. Well, the coming day of the Lord was a foreshadowing of God's presence, but we see that on that day, it won't be Israel who is judged, or it won't be Israel's enemies who is judged, but it will be Israel itself. Look at verse 16 with me. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, in all the streets they shall say, alas, alas, they shall call the farmers to mourning, and those in the, in, in the vineyards, there sh- oh, excuse me, all those waiting to, who are skilled in lamentation, all the vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. On the day of the Lord, the Lord will pass through the midst of the people. In verses 16 and 17, uh, that's, that's a direct consequence of what's alluded to in verses 10 through 15. Israel will be punished because they did not do what was just. They perverted justice. They did not do what God had commanded. 
Verse 16 says that there's gonna be wailing and mourning both in the fields and in the streets. The farmers themselves are gonna stop tending the fields and come into the city and wail and mourn. We see in verse 17 that the Lord will pass through their midst. Normally when the Lord passed through the midst of the people, when the presence of God was found with his people, it was cause for much rejoicing because the Lord would fight for them. The Lord would win their battles for them. If you recall the Exodus and the 10 plagues in the Exodus, the 10th plague was the coming of the angel of the Lord and he would pass through the land of Egypt and he would strike down the firstborn of all of the Egyptians, but he would pass over the firstborn of all of the Israelites because of the blood of the lamb. Well, now the Lord is passing through the midst of his people, but it's not for their salvation. It's for their judgment. The presence of God in the, in, in the midst of the people had always been a comfort to Israel, but now it's more like a curse. The only guarantee that Israel ever had for their victory in the face of an enemy is if the Lord fought for them. Now we see that the Lord is not fighting for them. He seems to be fighting against them. The people of God have seemed to become the enemy of God. Verses 16 and 17 describe the day of the Lord. Verses 18 through 20 give us commentary on what that day will look like. Look at your Bible with me. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into a house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? You see here, Amos is responding to the expectation that the people of Israel had about the day of the Lord. They expected the day of the Lord to be a day of light, a day of salvation. And Amos says, oh no, you've misunderstood. The term woe in scripture is the opposite of a blessing. There are blessings and there are curses we can think about that as a blessings and woes. When you see the word woe pronounced in scripture, it's a curse upon the people. The Amos comes to them with a question, why would you want the day of the Lord? Israel thinks they are on God's good side, but they are not. They think the day of the Lord will turn out to be a day of salvation, but in actuality, the day of the Lord turns out to be their destruction. And he frames all of this, the prophet does, by emphasizing it as a day of darkness. And he excuse me, illustrates, demonstrates, putting those words together, a very real reality. You cannot outrun the darkness. You know, if you, if you know, hey, the sun's gonna start setting, I'm gonna outrun the darkness. It won't work. Darkness always finds us. Every 24 hours, we find ourselves in darkness once again. In the same way, you can't outrun the Lord. So he gives this illustration as if a man is walking on the road and he, he sees uh, this wild animal. He sees a lion on the road. And so he turns around to run away from the lion just to run into a bear. That's not like a better situation, right? Yes, you escaped the lion, but now you have to face the bear. Or he gives the illustration of someone who's been running for his life and seemingly runs into his house to be safe, only to lean his hand upon the wall to be bit by a deadly serpent. You can't outrun the Lord. You can't hide on the day of judgment. In both of those situations, the man seemingly escaped, but eventually met his demise. This is to illustrate the point that the day of the Lord is coming, and there is nowhere that we can run. There's nowhere that we can hide to evade the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord will either be a day of salvation or a day of judgment for each one of us. It is both. While we live in a different context than Israel, there is a sense in which we are still waiting for that great day of the Lord. We want the Lord to appear, to vanquish all of his enemies, to establish his truth and his justice in every corner of creation. But the last day will simultaneously be the day of the most joy in the history of the world and the most sorrow. It will be both at one time. For the people of God, it will be a day of great joy. When we all get to heaven, 
What a day of rejoicing that will be. But for those who are the enemies of God, they will be judged. Israel fought. They were on God's good side. They claimed the name of the Lord, but they did not walk in his ways. They have deceived themselves. This is a reminder it is only the righteous remnant who will be saved on the last day. And I share all this because there is a remarkable kind of deception, a remarkable similarity between the deception of Israel in the Old Testament and the deception of what I fear are many people in our day. Many individuals today deny that the Bible is God's word, deny the cardinal teachings of Scripture, deny what the Scripture teaches about human sexuality, about marriage, about holiness. Many people in our culture regard Jesus as a good teacher and no more. They have little uh, regard for what God desires from a moral point of view, and yet these same people think that if there is a heaven, that they have done enough to get themselves there. Barna research indicated a number of years ago, uh, just interviewing Americans, that less than 1% of Americans expected to go to hell when they die. Of those interviewed, 64% believed they were on their way to heaven when this life was over. So too were the Israelites. They thought they were good with God but they were found to be actively opposing the Lord, which is why Amos gives them such a stark warning. Only the Lord will judge the last day, but the affirmation, I believe I will go to heaven, doesn't guarantee that you will. I'm not trying to scare anyone or to cause anyone to doubt their salvation, but hear these words from the lips of the Lord Jesus. Matthew 7 Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Did you catch it there? Jesus says that many people will call themselves by his name, but they will not do his will. That's exactly what Israel has done. They've proved that they're not truly God's people because even though they claimed God's name, they did not do God's will. They perverted justice. They didn't establish justice. How about you? Are you ready for the last day? If you stood before the throne of grace this hour, what would the Lord say of you? Though Israel claimed to know the Lord, it did not appear that the Lord knew them. And perhaps God in his grace is allowing you to hear a warning from me this day so that on that day, you don't hear the words, depart from me. I never knew you. I urge you, consider your condition before the Lord today and know that today can be the day of salvation for the Lord is still able to save. We see what Israel's problem was in this next portion of our text. We see that Israel had a worship problem. Second thing in our text that we see is that worship without justice is worthless. Look at verses 21 through 23. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. The first thing to note in verse number 21 is that the same word for hate is used there in verse 21 that's used in verse 15. Someone with your Bible open, tell me, what does the Lord say he hates in verse 15? Evil. The Lord hates evil. What does the Lord say that he hates in verse 21? He hates the feasts 
of his people Israel. What does that tell us about the feasts of Israel? They were practicing evil, not good. Notice in, the, in this text that the use of the word your indicates that God has no part in the worship of his people. Just look at this. It's your feasts, your solemn assemblies, your offerings, your fattened animals, your songs. All of those things God describes as your. They're, they belong to the people of Israel. But who is Israel offering these things to? Well, they're supposed to belong to the Lord. But it doesn't seem like the Lord wants any part of their ritual of worship. The emphasis here seems to be upon the people's actions and not the purpose of the people's actions. So just to give some example here, the goal of holding a feast in Israel was not just to eat, but to commemorate what the Lord had done. The assemblies of the people were to hear the word of the Lord. The offerings were to be devoted unto the Lord. The fattened animals were to be a reminder of how abundantly God had blessed them. The songs were meant to be songs sung in praise to the name of the Lord. But the Lord is saying through the prophet, you're doing all of these things in my name, but they don't have anything to do with me. The Israelites were quick to engage in religious activity, but you notice the Lord is quick to reject it. I bet a lot of people showed up at church in Israel's day, bet there was a good crowd but they had really good parking. They had good coffee. I bet they had a big offering each week. I bet the preacher's sermons were just the right length. They weren't too short. They weren't too long. He said things that people agree. Why are y'all laughing? I bet the preacher said things that the people agreed with, but he didn't really step on any toes. I bet the music sounded good. I bet they had the finest harpist to play their songs. I bet he was really skilled or she was really skilled on the harp. I bet the melodies that they sang were singable. I bet they were catchy. I bet there was melody and unison and harmony. And I bet the, the choir sounded good. I bet they sounded like a Nashville band. I bet all the congregants liked the music too. I bet no one said some of the songs were too fast or too slow or too new or too old or all of the other things that we tend to divide about. I bet everyone liked the music. I bet they had a great worship experience every week. I bet everyone was glad to be at church in the day of Israel. Everyone except the Lord. When they sang... The Lord stopped up his ears. I hope you see that my opinion about what makes good worship is really unimportant. And yours is too. New Testament scholar David Peterson, he's written, something is seriously wrong whenever people equate spiritual self-gratification with worship. When it comes to worship, there's truly only one person whose opinion actually matters, and it's the Lord's. This means that worship is not just anything goes, or if it feels good, you should do it. God cares how we worship. He has instructed us in his word how we are to worship him. Here in Amos, the Lord is telling us that there is a form of worship that is unacceptable to him. And I want you to see the danger here. Because we can sing all the right songs, pray all the right prayers, give all of the right amounts of money, and the Lord might still despise our worship. Notice he says, I don't like your feasts. He says, I hate your feast. This is strong language from the Lord of, Lord of hosts. How might that happen? Well, if we gather each week and do all these things, but our hearts are far from the Lord, if we claim the name of the Lord, but do not walk in his will and do not walk in his ways, if we proclaim God with our mouths, but deny him with our lives, well, we're no better than Israel was in Amos's day. 
This is precisely what Israel has done. They've kept up their appearances. From the outside, they looked really religious. They looked really pious. But they didn't love the Lord. They were hypocrites. The English minister, Matthew Mead, he's written hundreds of years ago, he wrote this. What a godly profession had Judas. He followed Christ, left all for Christ. He preached the gospel of Christ. He cast out devils in the name of Christ. He ate and drank at the table of Christ. And yet, Judas was a hypocrite. If our worship does not draw us towards the Lord, away from worldliness and sin, and encourage us in godliness, then our worship may very well be worthless as well. The plight of Israel was that their worship was frequent, but their righteous deeds were rare. And Lord, the Lord says that the problem with righteousness is really at its core a problem of worship. Look at verse 24 with me. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That verse is really about worship, isn't it? It's really about the people of Israel doing that which is right by worshiping their Lord with all of their lives, not just at their religious gatherings. Amos gives us a word picture here. In Amos's day in Israel, there were these areas called wadis, and a wadi was an area that would fill up with water during the rainy season. So we have those here. We just don't call them by a name like that. You got a pond in your front yard when it rains heavy, don't you, right? You got that, that pile of water or that puddle of water that fills up your front yard when it rains really hard. Well, if that was your source of water, you'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? Well, in Amos' day, there were these, these wadis that would, that would fill up with water during the rainy season, but during the dry season, they'd be dry as a bone. And Amos is saying, listen, you don't need to practice righteous occasionally. You need to practice righteous like an ever-flowing stream where the water never stops flowing. We should never stop pursuing righteous deeds. We don't just pursue righteous deeds on Sunday, not just one week out of the year, not just during a season, but if we are to be God's people called by his name, we should always pursue that which is just and that which is righteous. The problem with Israel's worship is that it did not fuel righteous living. It did not make the people more like their God. And this is a reminder to us that covenant obligations do not only exist for one day out of the week. The reason that the Lord was so angry and rightfully angry is because Israel disregarded his covenant. Consider marriage. Many of you are married. If you were to say, oh yeah, I keep my marriage covenant. I only commit adultery every now and again. And the rest of the time, I am totally and completely faithful to my spouse. It would be very clear that you have no understanding of what your marriage covenant actually means. That's the kind of lifestyle that Israel lived. Righteousness and justice were inconsistent practices. It's interesting to notice that these verses about justice and righteousness occur right in the middle of these verses about worship. Because proper worship will lead to a proper expression of justice. And this is a particularly well-known verse when addressing matters of justice in our world today, but we should remember the context in which this verse came from. If we don't worship the Lord, we can talk about justice all day long, but it won't be the justice that God intends for us to practice. This week, my attention was drawn to a quote uh, by the name of a, a man by the name of John Perkins. Perkins is a Christian pastor and an author as a disclaimer, he and I would likely have many disagreements about many things. Uh, I'm not endorsing all of his thoughts or opinions, but I think we can all agree with what he says about justice. He says there's four things Christians must do if they are to pursue justice in this world. First, start with God. If we don't start with him first, then whatever we're seeking, it ain't justice. Second, be one in Christ. Christian brothers and sisters, black, white, brown, rich and poor, we are family. 
If we give foothold to any kind of tribalism that could tear down that unity, then we aren't bringing God's justice. Third, preach the gospel. The gospel of Jesus's incarnation, his perfect life, his death as our substitute and his triumph over sin and death is good news for everyone. If we replace the gospel with this or that man-made political agenda, then we ain't doing biblical justice. Fourth and finally, teach truth. Without truth, there is no justice. And what is the ultimate standard of truth? It is not our feelings. It is not popular opinion. It is not what presidents or politicians say. God's word is the standard of truth. And if we're trying harder to align with the rising opinions of our day than with the Bible, then we ain't doing real justice. There's a lot to consider there, but I think he's spot on. And I think Israel missed it. Worship without justice is worthless. But also, justice without worship is pointless. We can be about justice all day long, but if we do not worship the one true God, oh, we are wasting our time. I think it's important to note that Amos does not give Israel a how to do justice seminar as if there are steps to follow to establish justice. No, what does he tell them to do? By his warning, he's telling them to worship the one true God. If we want to be people who are concerned about justice, then we will be people who are concerned about worship. We see this next thing in our text, that because Israel didn't pursue justice, the Lord gave them what they wanted. Number three, the Lord gives people what they want. Now you might hear that and you might say, that sounds like the prosperity gospel, right? Because I want a new car and I don't have a new car. I want a million dollars and I don't have a, new, a million dollars. That's not at all what I'm talking about, nor is that what the Bible actually teaches. What I have in mind is that Israel truly desires something other than the Lord, and so the Lord is just giving it to them. Look at verse 25. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? After describing that their worship is worthless, the Lord reminds them of a time when their worship was not worthless. It was when they trusted the Lord. There's a natural kind of rhetorical element in this question. So if you and I were having dinner and we were talking about something and I were to look across the table and I were to say, are you crazy? Right, the right answer to that question is no. Right, well, for some of y'all, maybe not, right? The, 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 question, the answer I'm trying to get out of that question is no. Well, the same way Israel is, or Amos is asking Israel this question, did you bring sacrifices in the wilderness? It's an implied no. But notice that even though they didn't bring sacrifices in the wilderness in that day and age, their worship was acceptable to God. Look at this contrast now. When Israel was in the wilderness, they lived in tents. They ate manna. They drank water from the rock. The Lord had to provide literally everything they needed to survive. Having nothing, they had everything because the Lord was with them. And now look at Israel. They live in big houses, they have elaborate vineyards, they are wealthy, they have all kinds of money, but the Lord is not with them. Having everything, they really have nothing because they do not know the Lord. It was better to be Israel in the wilderness generation, depending upon the Lord for the next meal and the next day and the next mercy than it was to be Israel during Amos's day. Maybe you feel today like you are wandering in the wilderness. Maybe you feel like all you have is the Lord and him alone. Well, the good news is, if all you have is the Lord, then you have all that you need. Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17 says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. If you have nothing today, you have everything that is necessary for a right relationship with the Lord. That's the good news of the gospel. What the Lord is after today for each one of us is not our money, it's not our singing, 
It's not our stuff, it's our hearts. Because the heart guides the rest of your life. The Lord wants your heart today. Does he have it? Because if he has your heart, he'll get everything else too, everything that he wants. And you'll understand if the Lord has your heart that everything that you have actually belongs to him anyway. It's rightfully his. Israel and Amos' day brought sacrifices. They came to worship, but they did not bring the sacrifices the Lord wanted. And we will see that it's only actually because Israel uh, didn't worship the one true God. Israel made gods for themselves. Look at verse 26 and 27. You shall take up Sikuth, your king, and Kayun, your star god, your images you have made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, the God of hosts. There are these two characters, two creatures, two deities that seem to be uh, mentioned in this text. They seem to be planets, stars of the heavens that the people of Israel worship. In this translation, the ESV translation, it translated as Sikuth and, and Kion. These were false gods that the nations would have worshipped. And notice what the prophet says. These are now the gods that Israel has made their gods. Let's understand what a terrible comparison this is. In Genesis 1 and 2, at the very beginning of Scripture, we are told that God creates man in his image. That there is a creator and there is a creature. That God is the creator and human beings are mere creatures. See what high opinion Israel has of itself. That they make the gods. We get to make the gods. We get to make them and they'll lead us where we want to go. Israel thinks that they are the ones who are the creators and that the gods should serve them. That's why they make these gods in their image. This is tragedy in the truest sense of the word. Consider this. Israel had a history of following the Lord. Started with Abraham all the way down through the Exodus. And once God delivers his people from Egypt, he marches them around in the wilderness and leads them. And where does the leadership of the Lord eventually lead the people of Israel? To the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. It worked out well for the people of God to follow after the Lord. Where will these gods lead Israel? Kayun and, and Sikuth, these star gods. Where will these gods lead Israel? In verse 27, it says, beyond Damascus. Far, far, far away from the promised land. Following the gods we make for ourselves will lead us to be in the opposite of the place where the Lord our God wants us to be. But we see in this text, the Lord is giving the people exactly what they want. He's saying, if you want to follow these gods, go ahead and follow them. See how far they get you. They take them to a place that's far away from where they need to be. But the Lord is doing exactly what his people have asked for. This should give us some pause. Do we want to baptize the things that the world values or do we have different values altogether as God's people? Israel wanted to take all of the things that the culture loved and appropriate them to their own lives. They wanted wealth, they just wanted to baptize it first. They wanted pleasure, just baptize. They wanted to be angry, but just baptize their anger. They wanted to hate others, they just wanted to baptize their hatred. Living the Christian life is not simply taking the things that the world values and then baptizing them. The Christian life is a different life altogether. So I ask these questions. How do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you care for your family? How do you speak to others? What are your priorities? How do you treat those who are different than you or who disagree with you? Is it different? from the way that the world reacts and responds? Do you strive for the world's approval or the Lord's? Friends, if you are in Christ, you have the Lord's approval today. In Christ, you have been provided everything that you need. So if you are in Christ today, the Lord looks upon you as blameless and spotless and righteous 
Why do you care about the opinion of the world? If we have the approval of the king of the universe, should that not radically influence the way that we live? Israel showed up on Sunday, but the rest of the week they lived just like the nations. And when they showed up on Sunday, the Lord was not there to meet them. Christopher Wright writes this, all idolatry is human rejection of the goodness of God and the finality of God's moral authority. Idolatry dethrones God and enthrones creation. Idolatry is the attempt to limit, reduce, and control God by refusing his authority, constraining or manipulating his power to act, having him available to serve our interests. A great reversal happens. God, who should be worshipped, becomes an object to be used. Creation, which is for our use and our blessing, becomes the object of our worship. Be careful, little eye, what you see. Be careful, little ear, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, what you speak. Be careful, little heart, what you worship. Do you know where the New Testament quotes this passage? It's in the book of Acts in chapter 7. And Stephen stands up to preach telling the Pharisees, telling the people of Israel exactly what the prophet Amos has told the people of Israel centuries earlier. And do you know what they did to Stephen? They picked up stones and they stoned him. I wonder what will it cost us to follow the Lord? Are we willing to endure it? Is the worship of God something that is so central and so important to us as God's people that we're willing to do whatever it takes to walk in his ways? I pray that we are. And I can assure you that whatever the cost is, it will be worth it. We don't mourn Stephen's death. We celebrate it. One last thought in closing. Old Testament scholar Alec Motier, he writes this, the evidence of true religion is that it touches all of life with the holiness of obedience to his word and command. He will not endlessly live with the stench of false religion in his nostrils and its noise in his ears. The Lord desires true worship today. May he be pleased to find it among us. May our prayers, our praises, and our gathering not be just noise in the maker's ears, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ, might our lives be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto him.